Thank you. Um, so happy to be here, and I, I appreciate you all being here as well. And uh, I want this to be interactive. Um, I have some slides, but please jump in at any time if you have a question. Um, so we, um, this is our mission statement, but it's, it's not anything super deep and surprising, but what we're engaging the, and empowering the public through investigative journalism, groundbreaking storytelling, and um, action. What we judge ourselves on is impact, and I'll talk to you later today about how we measure that and how we quantify that. Um, Okay, so one of the things we do, how many of y'all have heard of CIR Reveal? Okay, very well-informed audience, I can tell I'm already dealing with. Uh, very smart, um, but we're not exactly a household name, uh, like the New York Times or the Washington Post, but what we do is we partner with media organizations. So we have a staff of about 75 um, investigative journalists, editors, data specialists, video specialists, um, audio specialists, uh, one of our big platforms now is radio. Uh, and, and so we spread our storytelling through those platforms, but also uh, we work with all these partners, many more, this is just a selection of them, um, to get our stories out. One of the um, really exciting projects we got to uh, participate in recently was the Paradise Papers, which is, um, I'm sure y'all have heard of the Panama Papers. Paradise Papers was sort of part two of that, and it looked at how corporate America was offshoring its wealth. Companies like Apple, Nike, which keeps its swish um, off, offshore to, um, so that all the money generated from the swish goes offshore. offshore. And so we were part of that. We, we told that story on radio. Um, so we have a lot of different ways that we could partner with our various media partners. Um, so we tell our stories on all platforms. Um, this is a story that I, brought to um, the Center for Investigative Reporting with me from Oklahoma. This is an 18-month project um, about why Oklahoma is number one in locking up women, and it has been for 26 years. Um, and so we, I analyzed, and the CIR helped me analyze 18 months worth of data on incarceration in Oklahoma, and we looked at why women were um, being locked up at a rate that is, you know, really far and above any state and any nation in the, in the world. And what we found was that um, low-level drug sentences were being handed out by judges in Oklahoma, much longer sentences than other states, even red states like Georgia and Texas that were reforming their, their um, justice systems. Oklahoma was continuing to hand out 20, 30-year sentences for things like drug possession and possession with intent, which means you just had over the limit, the amount of drugs doesn't mean you were actually uh, caught dealing. Um, um, so one of the things we do with all of our big projects is have a community conversation. And later I'll talk about uh, trust in the media and how it has um, fallen off and ways to fix that. And we're trying to fix that, and so are many other news organizations. Uh, one of the ways we try to fix that is by talking to the community. And so we had a... Um, we had a forum, we drew 350 people in Oklahoma City to talk about criminal justice reform. The governor was there, people on all sides were there. In this picture you see um, the prosecutor of Oklahoma's second largest county who sent plenty of women to prison himself um, but wants to find a better way um, to give people treatment instead of prison. Um, we had a community conversation about that in, uh, after our project ran. Um, one of the other things that I suggested the CIR is that let's figure out how to get this data. We fought 18 months for this database of everyone who'd ever been convicted in Oklahoma and sent to prison. Um, and it took 18 months to get it from the state and analyze it. Uh, and so I wanted to get that out to local media organizations. They don't have the resources that we do. We have a very high powered team of half a dozen data analysts who know, you know all, these, all these skills that we need to analyze this data, but the local organizations really don't. And so one of the things I thought is, wouldn't it be cool if we could partner with coders, the coding community, Code for Tulsa, Code for Oklahoma City, Code for America, and get this data into the hands of local journalists who don't have database specialists. And so we had a summit, like a hackathon. We called it a hackathon. But it, it's, um, you know, you're just looking at the data and basically figuring out how to make dashboards so that local journalists can analyze this data and use it for future stories. And so that's one of the things that we're exploring at CIR. Okay, 
Um, we have one of our really exciting projects that we just launched um, is called Kept Out, and it looks at modern day redlining. Um, so lots of you all have heard of redlining, which is um, basically the old school way that uh, banks would say, don't lend in this area. Well, thanks to the uh, Community Reinvestment Act, which was passed 40 years ago by Congress, uh, it requires banks to lend to qualified buyers in blighted neighborhood, but it's full of loopholes. It doesn't take into account internet lending. It doesn't take into account mortgage brokers. It doesn't affect them. Um, and it didn't take into account gentrification. So these banks are able to loan to what we found, uh, mostly white people in areas where there were historically uh, neighborhoods that people of color lived in. And so we were able to um, take 31 million records that banks are required to disclose to the federal government uh, over two years. We looked at two years worth of data, 2015 and 2016. Um, and we found that there were, we used a very conservative measure, but we found there were 61 metropolitan areas that had a statistically significant um, margin of basically discrimination. They were discriminating against uh, people who were applying for home loans. And those are the areas that we highlighted. It doesn't mean that there wasn't discrimination happening in many, many other areas. Um, what it means is in these areas, people of color, Latinos, blacks, um, Asians, people of color were being discriminated against when they applied for loans. And we were able to hold everything else uh, steady in terms of um, income, the size of loan people were applying for, and also the area, the exact neighborhood and area that they were applying for the loan in. Uh, so the important thing about this project is that we were able to tell it on all platforms. So we had our website, we had the interactive data piece you see there with the map, and then we had the radio program, um, which goes to 450 public radio stations around the, uh, around the country. So it's like essentially millions of people just with that piece of it. Um, another exciting development that we've been able to um, harness with our journalism is our partnership with the Associated Press. Um, so we have, a, we have supplied our big investigations to AP and then they have shared this data in, on this project with all of their partners. So we've had dozens and dozens of papers around the country, some throughout the world, share the story. Um, we've had the Washington Post, uh, we've had the New York Times, but also the Chicago Tribune and as you see here in St. Louis, uh, papers took our data and were able to share it. There, so since we just posted it like Thursday or Friday, uh, and then we had the radio story, PBS has done two, a two part series, um, which has been seen by like two million people. And um, in Philadelphia, they've called for um, review of how, how their housing law is being carried out. Um, I mean, it's a little early to say. One of the things we do at CIR is we have an impact tracker and so we literally track laws that are passed, um, even small results like people who have a rally, things like that. Um, so what our hope is is that, you know, we can't dictate what the result is from our reporting. That's one thing that's important. We're not, uh, we're not, 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 we're not a community activist organization. We provide people with the information that they need to take action or not, and that's that's really up to the people that we serve. Um, so we have, as I said, we do tell stories on all platforms. We have a short documentary, really one of the first big video pieces that we presented um, called Heroin. I don't know how many of y'all have seen this on Netflix? Okay, I would highly admire, <laughs> my husband's like, yeah. Um, I highly advise you go, go, go watch it on Netflix. It's uh, less than an hour. It's about three women who are battling the opioid epidemic in West Virginia. Um, focuses on first responders, a judge, women who are trying to make a difference in their community against this epidemic. And um, we co-produced this and worked with a filmmaker named Elaine Sheldon to, um, to make this film. And we're really proud that it is a finalist for an Oscar in this short documentary. Uh, category. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, Gregory asked me to talk about trust in the media and fake news and um, how do we know what's real and so that's where I'm, I want to get, get to that uh, tonight. Um, some key facts for you guys, since 2000, like nearly half of the newsroom jobs in America, more than 20,000, um, have disappeared and revenues have plummeted to 
uh, by almost $20 billion. A lot of that is um, because sources of, traditional sources of revenue for newspapers, run of, they call ROP, run of, run of press display ads, have gone away. Classified ads have gone away. Class, you, know, you, have, you have Craigslist, you have Facebook, you have all kinds of other out, outlets to find things to buy and, and want ads. Um, so newspapers especially have um, tried to find new, new sources of revenue. That is not a ship that turns very quickly. I, I spent almost all my career in traditional um, print media in the Tulsa world, which I'm very proud to have worked there. They gave me the time to do um, a project on the death penalty in Oklahoma that was a finalist for a Pulitzer and you know, supported me through that. Um, and today they laid off 10 staffers. Um, they're now owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, who Warren Buffett said, I think it was today or yesterday in an interview, that he only thought two newspapers would survive in America. The, I think it was the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Um, I'm a little more optimistic than that, actually. Um, but that was on the same day that his company laid off uh, dozens of journalists nationwide. Um, there's, there's room for hope, and there's also room for concern and action. Um, so one of the things that's encouraging to me as a journalist is what's going on with the, the larger newspapers. I mean, the New York Times has reported $1 billion in subscription revenue last year. Um, the subscription revenue now accounts for more than 60% of the company's total revenue. Typically, when you look at a newspaper back in the day when I was at the Tulsa World, subscription revenue was like 10% of our revenue. So advertising, print advertising was 90, 95% of our revenue. The um, Washington Post has hired more than 100 new journalists, and they've doubled the number of uh, subscribers since January 1, 2017. There's a million people who subscribe only digitally to the Washington Post. I subscribe to both the Times and the Post. Um, I put my money where my mouth is. But there are exceptions. I mean, I thought this was a really interesting stat that I found today. There are uh, 7,000 newspapers uh, regularly published in the U.S., and 6,800, 6, basically, have circulation smaller than 50,000. So when you talk about the health of newspapers and you feel great about the Post and the Times and how everyone's excited about this big newspaper war and they're you know, gaining subscribers, and it, it does not affect the majority of, of media, um, especially print newspapers. And that's where roughly half of all news that you read is actually generated from a newspaper. Um, the, you know, the San Jose Mercury News used to have a newsroom of about 400. Today, there are about 150 journalists covering the Bay uh, in general. So that includes the Mercury News, the East Bay uh, newspaper, which you know, won a Pulitzer for their coverage of the ghost ship fire. Um, and then, what, two weeks later after they won the Pulitzer, they, they, had, they had major staff cuts, uh, which is a sad state of affairs, frankly. Um, but there's room for hope. Um, the growth of the nonprofit news is really important in our country. Uh, there are more than 120 nonprofit uh, newsrooms that are members of the INN. It's the sort of there's an umbrella organization of nonprofit newsrooms. Uh, they're across North America. These organizations don't have to depend on print uh, on, on ad revenue, and that is going to go away. So you have to have a different plan as a media organization for how you're going to bring in your money. CIR has um, this this picture down here is a community engagement piece that we engaged in around the elections and we sort of had a, a large effort where CIR organized groups of people in New Jersey to talk about the elections to sort of get engaged civically and that's a big trend in journalism is we can't sit on a, a pedestal anymore and, and just talk to people and deliver information to people. People expect a two-way conversation. Uh, and so as journalists, we're trying to figure out how to have that conversation. Um, organizations such as ProPublica and CIR, we've expanded coverage to new areas and offered training and resources to boost investigative reporting locally. So ProPublica has um, opened a whole newsroom in Chicago. They have 12 people covering Chicago and covering Illinois um, government and um, obviously a really important area of the country in the middle of the country. So typically... Um, all of the major media outlets have been based on the coast and sort of forget about the whole area in the middle of the country. I can tell you the reason I stayed in Oklahoma for 25 years is because there is a lot to investigate there. There's a lot to uncover. There's a lot of people that need our help. Um, and that's why it was hard for me to leave. 
Um, so it's super exciting to me to see organizations like ProPublica and CIR going to the middle of the country and um, helping local journalists learn how to do this craft. It's not brain science. Like, you can do this. It just takes mentorship, time, um, and, you know, organizations that are larger willing to mentor and help smaller organizations. Uh, to survive and thrive, though, I think news organizations, including ours, need to think about new ways to innovate. And, you know, diversity is a piece of this. Um, that means we have to work harder to attract new audiences. And to do that, you have to have a staff that is more diverse, that reflects America. Um, so one of the things we've done is an investigative fellowship program. It's the second year we've done it. I'm working with two fellows. So um, they come, they, they work with CIR over a whole year period on a big project. Um, and they stay in their home news organization. So the hope is they, they, they come for training, they come for, uh, we take them to a conference, investigative reporting conference, and then we work with them over a whole year period to, to produce a big project. Um, the hope is that they learn skills that are um, more time intensive at a higher level. They learn data skills, they learn investigative skills, they learn um, how to be a good watchdog, um, how to pull all this together. It's, it's a very sort of scientific reporting process and it takes some hands-on work as an editor to teach people this. Um, these skills, but we're really proud of this and we think it's going to make a difference. Um, we're also part of a, a, a new nationwide effort um, to develop mentorship skills in newsrooms nationwide. So one of the things we need to do is mentor our own staff and make sure that they stay and that they grow as journalists. Uh, so yes, media is changing. Uh, there is a cool uh, commission called the Knight Commission on Trust, Media and Democracy. They're going all over the country. They came to, I think, Stanford campus a couple months ago, and I, I was there to listen to what um, people were saying to them. Uh, and they are soliciting input from business leaders, from journalists, academics, the public, all, all sectors of America about what do we need to do to restore trust in the media and also, by extension, trust in democracy. Um, and some of the feedback they got, and I just picked out some things, um, you know, uh, tell people where you're coming from and let them judge. The new, uh, the, the, the sort of old thinking that you have, you have to be this completely dispassionate, neutral observer with absolutely no opinions. I don't know. I don't know if that works. I think that what we need to do is just be transparent. And we need to tell people, these are our principles. These, this is where we're coming from. And then you can judge. Um, that doesn't mean that you're biased, it means that you're clear about what your priorities are as a news organization. You can't be everything to everyone. So what is it that you're trying to be? Uh, develop very high standards of verification. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. It's really, really important that we show our work, that we link primary sources, um, that people can drill down and see the documents, that they know who our, what our sources' biases are, if, if in fact there are some. Um, so I think that we have to we have to think more about that and what, what gives people trust in what we do. Um, tell the public what our priorities are. So we, uh, we've chosen three sort of filters for our stories, accountability, inequality, and sustainability. And so I put a couple of examples there about different stories that we've done that sort of uh, fall along those lines. Um, we don't try to cover everything. There are some areas that other people are covering very well. Uh, you know, so we don't try to repeat what others are doing. We think about areas that others are not covering maybe as well and areas where we can have impact and make change. Um, continuous improvement regime for listening to the public. We have constantly have listening sessions. We have round tables, small groups, large groups where we listen to the public. I, I saw a really cool story about, I can't remember where it was, uh, Alabama. They had a round table of um, Muslim men and women that came and talked to their editors and gave them feedback about uh, the Muslim community in Alabama. If you can imagine, that's probably a small community and a, and a community that doesn't feel very listened to. Um, so the Alabama newspaper had a round table with them. They had a round table with gun owners and, and NRA members and did the same thing. And that was one of a series of round tables that they had. And the, that feedback informs their coverage. Um, so it's really important that we listen to people, um, especially people that don't get listened to typically in the media. Um, and show your work is something I tell my reporters often. You need to provide the raw materials used for stories. 
So the headline, how we identified lending disparities in federal mortgage data, just we, we gave a big explainer box um, in terms of where this data came from, how we did it. We often provide the raw data. Um, we want people to understand how we arrived at these conclusions. We also have experts that um, review a lot of our work. Um, so Gregory had asked me to talk a little bit about how can you know, you know what's right and what to trust. And I would bet that you're all very savvy news consumers that already know this. Um, but sometimes it helps to sort of talk about the finer points of it. So, um, you know, obviously the Russia mailing in our election, uh, they, they use social media platforms very effectively to exploit a vulnerability among some Americans um, who, for whatever reason, there's a growing inability to distinguish between fact and fiction. Um, and to swing, distinguish between trusted news sources and, like I say, trolls or even sites that look like real media. And it's not that easy, right? So after the shooting in Florida, there was a white supremacist group that claimed, we trained this kid, you know, and the AP, lots of other mainstream media sources reported this um, and then had to sort of backtrack. Uh, and so we're all learning as we go along uh, in this, in this in this environment, as I'm sure you all are. Um, here's some sort of thoughts. The Columbia Journalism Review um, had some good advice about how to, how to suss out reliable news sources. So they show a willingness to, to retract, to correct, to apologize for misstatements in a timely manner. So if you have a news source that is just clinging to this story despite numerous people who seem to know what they're talking about saying, no, this is wrong, and here's the evidence why it's wrong, uh, and there's no obvious way to alert the organization to an error, that's a red flag. Um, reliable news uh, outlets also re uh, rely on professional codes of ethics, uh, including you know, how to ensure accuracy, interest in contrary evidence, following the story regardless of its political, political implication. You should have the courage as a news organization uh, to write about something that goes against your editorial board or against what your publisher endorsed or you know, against the grain in your community. Um, and I just, you know, showing examples here of C uh, Center for Investigative Reporting, our ethics guide. Uh, it goes from uh, everything from aggregating news all the way to un unnamed sources. And it, there's 30 different topics, subtopics within our ethics uh, policy. So it's very detailed about how we can represent ourselves on social media, about how we identify our, ourselves as journalists, um, about how we label photos, how we edit photos, uh, all kinds of things, whether sources can pay for things. Uh, there's a lot of um, gray area, but we always err on the side of what feels right, what is right, what will give readers confidence in our independence. That's sort of the first, that's the first, you know, most important thing to me. Uh, we need to keep sources at arm, arm's length. We need to disclose any perceived conflicts of interest. So whenever you see a story in um, CIR that has any mention of a, a news or, uh, of a funding organization, we disclose that. So we did a story about, I can't remember what, it had something to do with Google. And Google News Labs gives us some money. And so we just, we always disclose that right up top at, as, a, as an editor's note. And people can look at the story and say, well, it was slanted or it wasn't or whatever. Um, I think disclosure is, is step one. Uh, you know, ob obviously, reputable news organizations always label uh, opinion as such and separate it from news. You'll see sometimes news organizations will label things as a you know op-ed or analysis, which is sort of a hybrid. Um, but you should quickly be able to tell if something is is analysis or it's opinion. Um, these are just some of our. Uh, standards, not all of them by any means, but some of them that, you know, the um, Institute for Nonprofit News has a very good list of standards that um, it advises nonprofit news organizations to adopt, and so we have adopted those. Uh, that we retain full authority over editorial content, that we have a firewall, um, that donors don't basically get to tell us what to write. That's what it boils down to. <clears throat> Um, and so lastly, you know, one of the things I do as a journalist myself is not only do I um, find news organizations that I trust, but I find journalists that I can trust, either within those organizations or within other organizations. 
there's some organizations that like I'm not quite sure about everybody there, but I know that this guy gets it right. And um, I think most people do more research about a restaurant that they go out to on a special night than they do about their news organizations that they share with with their uh, networks. And so I think an important thing to do is vet the news organizations that you regularly follow and that you share. Um, and so, you know, here's just a couple of things that I found on CJR and various other articles. You know, reliable journalists are calm. They're not, you know, screaming the news. They're not hyperventilating. It's, 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 they're not connected to the outcome of the news story. Uh, multiple positions or viewpoints, but there's this thing known as false balance, which you'll sometimes see in some organizations, um, especially around scientific topics. Most climate scientists, the vast majority of climate scientists, agree that global warming is occurring, agree, agree that it's man-made. That's science. And I think we can state facts as facts. Um, and so I don't feel the need in a news story to go out and, and find a climate scientist who disagrees that global warming is occurring. I think that, that's an example of false balance. Um, I do find the need, you know, to have multiple viewpoints on that issue. So you would might talk to the oil and gas industry about why they don't want to be regulated. Um, that's different. So also acknowledge gaps and inconsistencies. You know, you, a, a reputable journalist will have portions of the story that say, here's what we don't know. Or, you know, this, this person only told half the stories. Or last time he said this, but now he says this. So you should, be, you should find things like that in the stories of reputable journalists. Uh, and, and pursuing leads that run counter to your hunches and your preferences. And, and when that evidence pans out, you should you know, give it appropriate attention to the story. And this is harder to do than you would think. Because we all are informed by our life experiences. Um, and we choose stories because we're passionate about them. And the reason we're passionate about them is because we have an opinion. Uh, and so you have to be able to check that opinion at the door, um, tell people, why am I wrong? Why is this wrong? I want to see the other side of this. And frankly, as a journalist, it's the uh, shades of gray that are more interesting to me uh, than the black and white in life. Um, I just linked up here. Uh, Reveal has online on our site our guide to spotting fact, fake news and just has some general guidelines about you know, how to tell when things when things don't seem right. Um, generally, these things are framed for shareability. They're framed for uh, to be get demagogic. Um, and that doesn't mean that that means it's fake news, but there's certain hallmarks of, of, and when you say fake news, that means something that is completely made up and then completely wrong and not based in fact. That doesn't mean a story that I don't agree with, a story that, that um, makes a politician look bad that I, that I like. That's not fake news. What fake news is is complete untruths that are made up. Uh, basically, often th there's a profit motive involved. But whatever the motive, um, we should be in informed consumers and be able to be able to spot it. Uh, so that's the formal presentation. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. Yeah.